my questions are mainly around Prop 47 and some of the, what I'm understanding, increases in crime that we've seen as it pertains to property crime, larceny, since the passage. Um, to the district attorney in San Joaquin um, and um, Contra Costa, um, are, have you seen an increase in property crime and larceny? Do we have Ms. Beckton or Ms. Salazar? Yeah, sorry. Um, um, I think one of the things that um, we do, we I acknowledge is that um, since we've been in COVID-19 status, we really have had more crimes of what I might call desperation in our communities. Um, I would say that overall, we do see that the crime rates are continuing to decrease, but that in certain areas, especially um, as people have been unemployed, as people have been unhoused, we have seen certain crimes such as the categories that you have mentioned uh, take a slight increase. And so um, I don't think that that really uh, goes to whether or not our policies overall are working. I really think it goes to the conditions under which we've been working in the last year or so as we've been in COVID-19. So I would just, you know, um, say that there has been a study that has shown that since Prop 47 has passed that there has been an increase, even prior to the pandemic. And yes, I would agree that um, the pandemic has put a lot of people in very desperate situations. So we, we would expect to see some of these um, crimes. Is, is um, the other question I have. Oh, she on? If I, if I may jump in too, is that I do believe we've seen an increase in, from Prop 47 that we have seen property crimes go up. But what I think is the reason why is we don't really have any rehabilitative program for it. I know at least in my county, there's limited capabilities of doing a deflection or diversion in these cases um, that is is really uh, it tied the hands of us to, to kind of to divert this behavior. And I think the other issue you've seen the increase in crime has been identity theft. That for sure has happened and in most cities across the United States. And I don't know that you can necessarily the correlation is between those spikes because of Prop 47 or the lack that poverty has increased it with the increase in our community significantly. So here in San Joaquin County, 25% of my, of my community lives at or below the poverty level. On top of that, 15% cannot sustain uh, a $400 medical emergency. So 40% of my community is struggling economically. And I think that plays the key role in really seeing the increase in poverty level offenses. And those are gonna be theft related um, and they're gonna be substance use. Most of the individuals that I'm dealing with on large scale identity theft cases, which are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of victims um, are, are really driven by substance, substance and untreated substance and untreated mental health. I have 40 beds in recovery. I'm 750,000 people in my community. You know, I, I, we are very short on the ability to take individuals that are, are, are using theft as a mechanism to support a habit or mental health or poverty and really place them in a situation where we can really address their needs. So we have we have seen it, um, but I don't know that the correlation is necessarily because of 47. Some people might think, well, I'm only gonna get a misdemeanor, but you're still gonna get a misdemeanor if that's the case. What we have seen is a, a tremendous spike in poverty. And I believe when COVID winds down, the economic wave could be you know, a big, big factor as well. So we'll see. And my next question, I have two questions, this question and one more question, um, is to Judge um, Espinoza. Um, if, if I may, may read, in, in the county and city of Los Angeles, we have a at crisis level homelessness problem, um, drug e epidemic, meth epidemic, um, and mental health crisis at our hands. And it seems like those are all interconnected as well. And our city, I'm just gonna read what, you know, are some of the officials um, from both LAPD and even Mayor Garcetti have spoken on is, since um, it has been regulated now down to a misdemeanor that is um, um, possession, uh, there is more of a revolving door. We don't have the ability to have people go into treatment facilities like we had before. So it's had some effect on the street level. 
And Mayor Garcetti says also, I agree with them. If somebody gets arrested, they're not going to serve any jail time. If they do serve time in jail, they're not going to be prosecuted. If they don't get prosecuted, if they do get prosecuted, they're not going to be sentenced. And if they are sentenced, they are out right away. It's a broken system. I'd like to know your thoughts on the system being broken and how we need to intervene um, to, to, to sometimes demand treatment um, because it is also increasing crime. So most of the literature that I've read seems to indicate that forced treatment is not the best model. It's not as successful as voluntary care and uh, treatment for people with substance use disorders it seems to be the focus of your comments. I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I have to think that the mass incarceration that resulted from felony prosecutions for drug possession um, were not helpful. Um, there were too many people in state prison and county jail. And even when you have forced um, care, forced treatment, that has to be matched with um, resources to provide care and treatment, which um, has never been the case. And so I don't think the answer is felony prosecutions for simple possession um, to end homelessness and substance use disorder arrest. I, I don't, the answer is services. There are a number of strategies. We are a harm reduction um, organization that believes that you have to meet people where they are get them stabilized in the community and begin dealing with their unmet behavioral health needs, whether it's mental health or substance use disorder. So I'm not sure that um, if the mayor is saying we need felony prosecutions to, to be successful at providing treatment that I would agree with him, but I'm not sure that's exactly what, what he said in that statement you read. Thank you. And lastly, um, to the DA um, in, in San Joaquin County, I think just yesterday, um, there 57 people were arrested in um, trafficking, and those 57 people um, thought that they were meeting up with a 13-year-old. Um, have you seen an increase? Because anecdotally, in in my community, in Los Angeles County, in Ventura County, across the state, um, I feel like there is a and, and have read there is a growing problem with child human trafficking. Um, mm -hmm. Is there an increase in, in, in your county? I think there's an increase across the United States of America I think, and worldwide. Um, I think we have definitely, I think it's always been there. Maybe we just didn't see it for what it was. Often that we were prosecuting, you know, young men and women um, in, in a transgender community, you name it, at 18, 19, and 20 years old for what we considered in that day prostitution. And nobody ever asked, how'd you get here? How come you're 18 years old and you're here? How did, how did, what was your journey? Instead, we looked at it again as doing harm and not reducing the harm by incarcerating everybody does nothing. Because in this situation, we, we just took them in for a couple of days, uh, maybe 10, 20, 30 days, depending on the judge that you had at the time. And then they were back out with no services, no opportunity to be lifted up and to be healed. So we, we really have to look at that because like your scenario before with the Prop 47 cases. So if you, even if you moved it back to a felony conviction for say, it used to be in the day three to five prior petty thefts would get you a felony conviction. And even then a judge would give you less than 120 days on average, which allows you to do alternative work program. So you're not going back in for any programming. You're just doing more jail, more fees and fines, and you're still gonna come out still have mental health, still have substance use issues, and still be living in poverty, probably more poverty because of what we did. And even if I only book you for 48 hours, say for what a lot of people want us to do, is to, and sometimes flash incarceration does work, but when you're looking at people that are driving from poverty and you give them 48 hours, that's still $2,500 of the taxpayer's dollars for the arrest, the prosecution, and the defense, and the court's time by the time we get there. So it's still a lot of money and resources. And if you're gonna be released and there's no more additional time and no programming, we really haven't done anything except spent, spent a lot of money. And then circling back to human trafficking, yes, absolutely. And we're very aggressive in our community. We're constantly working every tool and technology that we have available. There is not a lot of money uh, funding and mechanisms um, for the investigation, which is very labor intensive, but also there needs to be a significant investment in the healing. Um, right now, I'm working with an 18-year-old. In the evening, I volunteer and I go out to the homeless camps. 
and I work, especially since COVID had started. I have an 18 year old transgender young female who comes in for a day or two, then goes back out for a week or two, comes in for a day, goes back out. We don't really have any facility that can really address the long-term trauma. She was trafficked since the age of 12. Her grandmother turned her out in exchange to pay off her debts for the drug lords that were selling money to her or selling drugs to her. She's been um, trafficked for the last six years, has suffered tremendous psychological, physical, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, a number of things have gone on. We're trying to address all of those and stabilize her. A few months ago when I was out on the street, I brought her food in the hopes of trying to get her to come back in. Um, her trafficker saw me, he took her phone and he texts literally death threats to me. As he goes, I know who you are. I won't even tell you the language. It was horrific. And he said, if you think you're going to take my money maker, I'll kill you and I'll kill her too. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. It is a very violent world and it is a very dangerous world. And, and we need to have to understand that we cannot just go get somebody off the street and expect it to be perfect, that they're going to come in and they're going to travel. Uh, my two advocates that are human trafficking victim survivors, it took one 10 years and the other two years before we could finally move them out of the lifestyle, if you will, and into safety. So I think that if you're when you're looking at this human trafficking, and especially we're seeing such an increase with the internet, obviously, and the readily available and accessible, but we're seeing it on the street in the you know in the old days on the blade right now. Anybody that looks under 18 is going for two to three times the market value. Um, there's a you know I mean I can tell you horrific stories, but I don't want to traumatize everybody this morning. But it's a critical issue. It's an expensive issue as well, and I, I don't mean to put a number on it. But the healing of a, of a trafficked victim is years and years in the making, and uh, and it's very complex. And so we would appreciate any support on both sides. We need more investigative tools because most of this is happening online. Um, and though I still have a high population on the street, like I said, and then the other part is the healing, very critical for us. So thank you for shining a light on this. It is critical.